Now we're going to determine and place sights. Sights are non-aircraft that are in my draw cup here. And it shows on central command that the sights are approach, that's what the APP is, of two, and center, the CTR, of two. If we look on the tactical display, we can see these four that are labeled as approach, north, south, east, and west. Not pre-approach or standoff, but just approach, and center is where the target card is at. What that two and two means is for each approach location, I'm going to draw two sites, and for the center, I'm going to draw two sites. So we're going to have two, four, six, eight, ten sites drawn total, and we'll start drawing our sites. We'll start with the north approach and work our way around clockwise, and I'll bring them up on the screen. The first one I have is an SA-2. that will go into the north approach. Next, we have an SA-6, or CR Alpha-6. And we'll move over to the east and draw a CR Alpha-15. You may have noticed at the back of these counters say no bandit, and that'll come into play when we're actually drawing bandits. Again, that was a CR Alpha 15, followed by another CR Alpha 6. Here we have a CR Alpha 10, another 6. Here we have CR Alpha 14, which are infantry with weapon systems, a CR Alpha 15. And now we're going to draw the two for the center. This is a Sierra Alpha 8 Alpha. There in the center. And finally, another Sierra Alpha 8 Alpha. We'll put the cup back over here. And we'll look in, let me look at the counters, which one's going to give me the most to show you. Let's take a look at the SA-15 real quick. I'll explain the different icons on these enemy chits. In the upper left, you'll see on this one, it has a R and an S in the upper left corner inside a black box. The R stands for radar. That means weapons that can target radar targets will get a bonus attacking this particular one. The S means soft. If there's a weapon that gains more damage or an advantage against soft targets, it would also against this target. Those three numbers, one, five, and seven. That's what I would have to roll when the enemy is firing at one of my aircraft. If you roll higher than the first number, but lower than the middle one, the pilot is going to get one stress added on to them. If you roll higher than the second number, but lower than the third, in this case a five or a six, it would damage the plane. It would knock off all the weapon systems on the plane. Apply it at that time is really just flying evasive maneuvers and flying around. Can't really attack anymore. If they roll higher or equal to or higher than the third number, the plane is destroyed and the pilot would have to eject and we'd have to do a, a search and rescue roll uh, in the homebound section of the sequence of play. That negative one refers to my penalty when attacking my rolls. I would subtract one. Some targets have a plus number on there. I would gain an advantage when attacking. The one in the black circle is the range. In this case, it's one. It could attack aircraft in its area and in one adjacent area. And the H and the L stand for high and low. My planes will come flying in and I'll have a, either a high altitude or a low altitude with each plane. And this particular weapon system can attack planes on either high or low altitude. Some of the counters can only attack high, some can only attack low. On some of the counters, that's not a great example for the first number since it's a one. I mean, there probably are cases where you could roll less than a one with penalties, but some of these ones have a higher number. Say it's five, like on the Sierra Alpha 6. If they roll 
a one through four, then they completely miss. So if it's below that first number, the enemy misses the aircraft it's shooting at. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you here as I'm talking through it, and I'm talking a lot before I get to the actual gameplay, but I want you to understand the game and also kind of understand the decisions I'm making. So if you want to pick the game up, you'll understand how it plays and if that's for you or if it's not a game that you would like to play. Again, Dan Vierson Games are one of my favorite companies, especially for solo games. And I know a lot of people have been asking for a war game. I hope this fits that niche. It's not exactly a big map with two armies or multiple armies going at each other, but I really enjoy their games. Next, we're going to assign pilots. That's the next step in the sequence of play in the pre-flight section. So I will go through my pilots and see, in this case, basically who's not going to go, since I'm going to send my, my recon plane eyes and six other pilots, since eyes doesn't count. So only really one will be left behind, since I only have eight. I know some of these will have some glare on them. I apologize for that, but I will be putting them up on the screen anyway. The one pilot I did not take is Shepard. And as you see on his card, his A to A, air to air attack is a negative two. He is the worst one out of all my pilots and the only pilot with a negative rating in air to air combat. And since we have the potential, it probably we probably won't get all of them filled because there are some no bandit tokens as we draw for bandits, but there's potential for 13 enemy aircraft to start in play. So I definitely want planes that can do air-to-air -air attacks well. And we do have some ground targets to go after. And I have a few planes that are either zero or plus on air-to-ground. So those will be the ones that are carrying more of the air-to-ground munitions at the same time. So we've selected our pilots. We have to select our flight leader. And the flight leader is going to be the pilot with the highest skill rating. Or if there's a tie you would choose. In this case, Farm Boy is our only skilled pilot, so he'll be the flight leader. And if we look in the upper right of his card, I'll go over real quick what the items on the pilot's cards mean. You can see Farm Boy is a skilled pilot, and he has an eight in the upper right corner. That means he needs eight experience to go to the next level, and the next level would be veteran for him. He's flying an F-14 Tomcat, Again, close to the upper right, you'll see a green number two with an SA, that is situational awareness, which are these tokens here. They're double-sided, and I think they go up to four. He starts with two situational awareness, so I'll put two single tokens on his card. Situational awareness allows a slow pilot if they use one situational awareness, it allows that slow pilot to attack during the fast phase. And then when the slow phase comes up, they can attack again because they're a slow pilot. It works the opposite for a fast pilot. It would allow a fast pilot to attack during the slow phase. And because they're fast, they would be able to attack in the fast and then in the slow also. In this case, my only fast pilot is Shepard, so all of these pilots would attack during the slow phase. So situational awareness will let them go during the fast also. On the bottom left, you'll see a number one, a green number one with a C that stands for cool. And that's how much stress will come off of them during the recovery phase, how much additional stress will come off of them. Most pilots have zero in my squadron. That is the only pilot that has a cool. Then we have the chart here. You see it says stress 0 to 5, 6 to 9. That tells you what status they're in, whether they're an okay pilot or if they're in shaken status. What happens when they get into the shaken status, you can see his stats go down. His air-to-air -air drops to a negative 1, and his air-to-ground attack drops to a negative 3. If they get above shaken, in this case, if he had a 10 or more in stress, that means unfit for duty. And they would have to stay out of missions until they were in a level that allowed them at least back into the shaken area. Below those, you see a bunch of numbers and letters. Those are the weapon systems or the missiles, bombs, etc. that this particular plane, the F-14 Tomcat, can carry. They're in yellow. If we look back to the Syria 2004 card, the standard weapons and special weapons have to line up with that, which means... 
if there's a standard weapon like rockets over here on the Syria 2004, and then we come back to Farm Boy, we see that rockets are not listed in those yellow, which means he could not equip rockets because that type of plane, or sorry, that type of aircraft does not allow rockets to be mounted on it, uh, like a rocket pod that would be. So you, you're kind of correlating between the time era and the weapon systems that the aircraft is capable of carrying. So you got to cross-reference those two when you arm the aircraft to make sure you're not using something that shouldn't be. Over on the bottom right, you see a yellow eight with a W that is weight. It can carry eight weight worth of weapons. In this case, we're attacking target 47, which you see has a weight point minus one. That would mean instead of eight, this plane can only take seven unless I spent the six points for a tanker to take away that one weight point penalty. And I don't want to spend six with only 20 SO points right now. At the very bottom, you see that this plane also has equipped a 20 millimeter cannon. That's not something you have to arm. That's on that aircraft and it can always be used. Cannons can only be fired at low range. You have to, I'm sorry, low altitude. So it has to be flying low and would need a 10 or higher to hit a target and has a range of zero, which means you have to be in the same area. And we'll go over the different areas here and how that works when we get to actually flying planes and doing some uh, attacks. It looks like all of my planes have a 20 millimeter cannon except for the Echo 2 Charlie Hawkeye flown by Eyes because that's a recon plane. It doesn't have any armaments on it. But thanks to Eyes, we're gonna get a plus one for my air to air rolls, which is gonna help a lot with as many bandits as we have. Eyes, you can also see, has two situational awareness also. You might be asking, why does a pilot that can't attack have situational awareness? Because the flight leader and this particular aircraft can give situational awareness to other pilots in the squadron. The flight leader always can, and this aircraft can. So Farm Boy and Eyes can distribute situational awareness at key times to allow these slow planes to attack in the fast and slow phase during that particular turn, which is a very strong thing to have if you want to take out some of the more dangerous sites and bandits early on. You can attack twice and try and take as many out as possible before you close in into their range. We've assigned pilots next we're going to arm the aircraft. And this is a pretty long step for me. I like to debate back and forth with myself what I'm going to need to take on a mission to not only take out the target, but to defend myself from the various sites and bandits that'll come up. And you'll notice the bandits aren't on the target display yet. We do not place bandits until our aircraft are armed and we put our aircraft on the display then we'll find out which bandits they have scrambled to defend it and where they will be at. So you have to kind of spread yourself around with enough weapons, air-to-ground and air-to-air -air weapons, and accommodate for what might come up. So I'm going to, off-camera, arm all of my aircraft, of course, except for eyes. And then when I come back, I'll show you what I armed the aircraft with. I'll show you a little bit about the weapons themselves and what they can do. And I'll explain my thought process behind using and selecting the weapons that I did select. I have completed the arm aircraft step of the pre-flight sequence. I know there's some glare on eyes right here, but eyes has those two situational awareness, but no weapons. So that's not really keeping us from seeing anything. Now I had to keep in mind when arming my planes with ordnance that this target 47 is in the second band here in Syria, which means my weight points are minus one. I did not want to spend to get the tanker priority, which is a number of planes times one in special option or SO points. That would have cost me six. I did spend four right here and you'll see why when we get into the sequence. These are AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. And since Farm Boy is in an F-14 Tomcat, that is the only aircraft that can carry 
and use those types of missiles. And currently, Farm Boy's air to air is a plus one. Now we'll go through the rest of the pilots here. Along with those four Phoenix missiles, Farm Boy also has a couple of AIM-7 air to air rockets. And you can see these yellow slashes on the chit. Those denote that these are air to air weapons. It's just a little bit easier for you to look at your aircraft real quick and see how many air to air and how many air to ground weapons you have on them. I chose these as a backup in case we get a lot of bandits when we go to draw them. The AIM-7s can fire at a range of two. I want to be able to shoot at these bandits from a far distance. You'll see that there's a red zero on the AIM-7s. There's also a red zero on the uh, AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. That means they cannot be fired at range zero, which is if you're in the same area as the bandit you're firing at. Farm Boy, along with all of my other planes, with the exception of eyes, have an ECM, or Electronic Countermeasures pod, and those are very useful for suppressing attacks before they even get to you, and you don't have to use evasive maneuvers or suppress them with other pilots. There's always a chance that that ECM pod will save you, and that stays on your aircraft throughout the mission and is activated each time you're targeted with an attack. We'll move over here to Duke. We have Duke with a pair of AGM-88 HARM, H-A-R missiles. These are armed because I want to be able to take out radar sites. You see at the top right it says R4. All attacks are rolled on a 10-sided die and you have to get equal to or greater than the number after it's been modified to have a successful attack. And since almost every one of these sites is a site that can be taken out by a radar-guided weapon, I chose to put the AGM-88s on Duke, who has an air-to-ground plus one. That way we can take out targets from far away before we're within their range. Also, you'll see that there's a red H on there. That means these targets... Uh, these weapons can be fired while I'm at a high altitude. And if we look back at the board real quick, you can see most of these sites only have the green L, which means they can only attack my plane if they're at a low altitude. We have one, two, three, four sites that can attack at high, and three of them are high and low. And those are the ones we're going to want to take out quickly that way we can stay at a high altitude and these other sites will not be able to target us and we can just concentrate on the bandits. Back to Duke, we also have a large MK-84 bomb and a backup, a smaller MK-82. Both of those, you can only fire those, or sorry, drop them, if you're at a low altitude. So I will have to drop down to a low altitude when I'm over the target and I'll have to be in the center zone because you can see it's a zero for range to try and take out central command. I didn't have enough weight to carry anything else. This is already seven weight points, which is the number in the upper left corner of each chit. My weight rating is an eight and it's minus one because we're in the second band. We move over to Griffin, has the same exact loadout as Duke. He's also flying an F-18 Charlie Hornet. Blackhawk also on a Charlie has a lesser air-to-ground capability. Blackhawk is a negative one for air-to-ground, but he's a zero for air-to-air, -air, so I threw on a couple of AIM-7 missiles for backup in case we can draw a whole bunch of bandits, and a couple of medium-sized Mark 83 bombs to try and take out this target. We move over to Lightning, also in an 18 Charlie Hornet, has the same loadout, I'm sorry, has a similar loadout, to Blackhawk with the two bombs, but is also carrying some AGM-88s to try and take out some of these radar sites. And lastly, our newbie, Caveman, who happens to be in the plane that can carry the most weight, an FA-18 Echo Hornet. His skills are not too great, but his air-to-air -air is a zero, so he's starting out at least with a good air-to-air, -air, no negative modifier. So I put several AIM-7 missiles on his plane. We also put a medium weight Mark 83 and a couple of lightweight Mark 82 bombs, even though his air to ground is a negative two, just as a last resort if we have to use them to do any additional damage to get to nine hits. Now what I forgot to do is if we look at the, oh no, that's not with this one, I'm, I'm sorry. That's a center bandit. If we look on the minor airfield, it has an improvement. So when we draw bandits, we're gonna have to draw one additional center 
chit for a possible bandit in the center on top of the ones that are already on the central command card. We're going to lose one victory point at the end thanks to our scud launchers that we're not going after because we just don't have the resources or the pilots aren't skilled enough yet to split them up. And I really need to take out this central command target because we are doing a night mission. And if this stays in play, any gains we have every day, we're going to lose a little bit of recon intel and infrastructure. Plus, since this is a night mission, you see that there's a six there for the amount of aircraft we can bring. Night missions are more stressful, but if they're successful, you get special options points for night missions equal to the number of aircraft that can go. So this would give me six of my SO points back, which is a huge thing, especially here in a short campaign. Our aircraft are all armed. We're going to move into the target-bound flight sequence of play. The first thing we do is draw a target-bound event card. So we'll draw an event card, and it is the Bandit's Inbound card. And if you look at it, it says roll three attacks against random aircraft. Roll one less attack for each air-to-air -air counter expended. And we can see there's a possible that we're going to damage planes and even destroy them, which would damage would take off all of my weapons. So we do not want that to happen. And destroyed, of course, would destroy the plane and we'd lose a pilot, possibly. So we're going to expend air-to-air -air counters from our pilots. For every one we get rid of, we roll one less attack. So if we get rid of three, we won't have to roll any attacks. So I'll look at my pilots, and I have several air-to-air -air counters, but not a ton of them. Blackhawk and Caveman are both carrying AIM-7s. I'll get rid of two AIM-7s right there. And where do I want to get rid of one more? I don't want to get rid of any from Farm Boy, since his air-to-air -air is plus one. They're both... Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of another one from Caveman because Caveman can be unfit for duty if he goes above five and at least Blackhawk would not be there until he goes above six. Since I got rid of three counters, that negates the bandits inbound. Oh, I made a mistake. I forgot that I have eyes. Eyes says that I can ignore events on a seven plus. So I can actually roll before I expend those counters to see if I can negate it completely with just I's special ability. So we need a seven or higher. It is a five, it is not. So we'll go ahead and do what we already did and expend those three counters to negate the bandit's inbound target bound event. And the way you do target bound events, if we look again at the bandit's inbound card, if it's target bound, it's the first section. If it's over target, it's the middle red section. If it's homebound on your way back after the mission, it's the lower section. And that's where the, the deck, even though there's a, a, not a huge deck, every one has three different things on it. And depending on what phase you draw it in, which part of that event that you'll read. Now we're gonna place our aircraft, that's the next step. And we're going to use our pilot's chits up here. And if we look on them, you can see that they have an H for high altitude and an L to denote that they're at low altitude. When we place our pilots or place the aircraft, we start in the standoff attack area, which is the outer band all the way around the board. You can't see it here because of the fold, but there is a line in the middle here breaking the north and south standoff attack areas into two sections, just like the east and the west here. First, I'll place Eyes, who's going to hang out in this far area anyway. There's this dangerous weapon here, the SA-10, that has a range of three in that black circle, which means it can basically hit anything anywhere, because as long as a section of the board is adjacent to another section, you can go there. For example, if I was way up here and this has a range of three, it could simply go one into the middle or center. Oh, I got that wrong. It'd be quicker if I went one to this adjacent area, all the way up here, two, and then three. So there's really nowhere to hide from this thing. So we want to really get that taken care of right away. 
That's the most dangerous one on the board right now because of its range. And Eyes is basically just going to hang out here for the entire mission because we do not want it to get shot down. Same with Farm Boy. We don't really know where the bandits are going to be yet, but Farm Boy's Phoenix missiles have a range of four, which means it'll be able to hit anything on the board. So we'll have Farm Boy fly in from the north. Duke and Griffin have our bombs and AGM-88, which are the missiles that are good at taking out radar sites. So we'll have Griffin come in from the south, go after this dangerous one here. The next most dangerous would be this SA-2 because it has a range of two, but this SA-10 here, that is the most dangerous because on a roll of just three, it's going to do uh, some form of negative effect to your aircraft. So we'll have Duke come in from the north and I am starting all my aircraft at a high altitude to keep them away from these uh, low altitude weapons or weapon systems. Blackhawk has a little bit of air to air and some bombs. So we'll have Blackhawk come in from the south in case we have to do some air to air attacks that Duke can't reach in the later turns. Lightning only has air to ground munitions. So we'll have Lightning come in from the west this upper west portion. We're also going to want one of these pilots to take out this dangerous SA-15. It only has a range of one, but with a one as its first attack, it means it's always going to do something negative. And we have two of those, I believe just two. Yeah, we only have two right now. There are things that can bring others out though. And finally, we have Caveman, our new guy. He has one air-to-air -air weapon left and some bombs. We'll just have him come in over here from the east. Now all of our pilots are out on the board. We've placed our aircraft. Now we're going to determine and place bandits. Now this is where we have to get lucky. If you look in the cup, you can see that some of them on the other side say no bandit. Half of the chits have no bandit on one side, and the other half have an enemy aircraft. So we're gonna to wanna to draw these, and we're gonna do the approach areas first. We'll start with the north and then go clockwise around the outside. On the central command card, you can see that the approach areas get two bandits each or two draws each, so it doesn't mean there's necessarily gonna be two there. Oh, we started off already with a bandit. That's not a great start. In the north approach, that is a MiG-29. That's a dangerous one because of the one. It can damage aircraft quite easily. And then right away, we have another MiG-23. I dropped that, let's add it back to the cup. Bad start. We'll swivel around to the east. No bandit, that's good. Very good. Head to the south now, and we have an SU-27, and another one for the south. Oh, a MiG-23. This is going to be a rough one. Heading to the west. Another MiG-29. This is going to be a really rough mission. And a MiG-21. Ouch. Out of eight possible draws, we drew six bandits. That's bad odds in the other direction. But now we have to draw five for the center. Let's hope for a bunch of no bandits here. That's one no bandit. That is another. That is a MiG-23. Two more. That is a no bandit. And finally, a no bandit. So the center only has the one bandit, but that makes sense because we drew so many bandits early on that there was probably a lot of no bandit tokens left. I did forget the center site has two sites in the center, but the intel says plus one center site, so we should have another one. And it's going to be an SA-11 another very dangerous weapon system because it can 
hit at a range of three and it has very low numbers to start damaging aircraft. So the bandits are placed. We will remove the no bandit counters from the board and we'll just have to go with what we have left here. We do have two, four, six, seven bandits to worry about. We don't have a whole lot of air-to-air -air rockets available either, thanks to that event, but we'll make the best of it. Since this is a night mission, I have these stress tokens. You put these on your pilots to show how much stress they currently have on them, and because this is a night mission, at the beginning of a night mission, every pilot flying that mission gets one stress. And that's what I was talking about as far as being a stressful mission. Plus at the end of the mission, we're gonna gain two stress if we look on the Syria map, just for being in the second band. So these pilots are going to have a minimum of three at the end of this mission and any more that they gain. I have to be careful with our newbie over there, Caveman, because if Caveman goes above five, he's unfit to fly. Well, adding that center, extra center bandit, I actually didn't do it at the wrong time because the very next part of the process is the Intel Air Defense Adjustment. And that's when you look over here and make your adjustment. And that's when I would have added it at plus one center site. Now we're going to draw the over target event card, which will be the middle section. And we have Fleet Resupply. No adjustment, so no positive or negative effects. Next, we have our very first attacks. These are going to be the Phoenix missile attacks. That's step 11, part of the target-bound flight. And that's why these Phoenix missiles are important and worth spending SO points on if you think you're going to run into a lot of bandits. Because you can fire these before you even get into your first turn to try and take out some of the more dangerous bandits. Plus... Phoenix missiles are independent weapons. I can send all four of them off right now, and each one can target a different bandit. So let me determine which ones I want to fire at real quick. During this phase, I will fire off all four rockets, all four of my AIM-54 Phoenixes. I'm definitely going after these two MiG-29s because they hit very easily, and they have a range of three. Now, I still have to roll, so it's not a guarantee that I'm going to hit them. You can send multiple missiles after the same target, but since I have so many dangerous targets out there, I decide to only do one each. We're also going after this SU-27 that has low numbers and a range of four. A range of four, you can effectively hit anything anywhere. And I'm going after this MiG-23 because it has a range of two, which means it's only two away from going after a reconnaissance plane that's going to give us plus one to our air-to-air -air rolls. Also, I didn't bother rolling eyes, uh, ignoring event on a 7 plus when we got that over target event card because there was nothing that happened. So we will go ahead after these four aircraft. If we look at Farm Boy, who's firing these, his air-to-air -air is plus one. And if we look at the Phoenix, missile itself. We have a six in the upper right, which means we need to roll at least a five because of Farm Boy's plus one against every aircraft we're firing at except the MiG-23. You see the plus one in the upper left corner, which means we get an additional plus one to our roll. So that one we would need a four or better to take out. We will go after the bandits in Clockwise order starting from the north. The first one you can see on screen right here is the MiG-29, which I need a five or better. I got it. So that MiG-29 will be taken out. We come around to the left and it's just off the screen is our MiG-23. I'll put it up on the screen there. And the AIM-54. This is the one where we need a four or higher because of Farm Boy's plus one and the plus one for attacking it. Again, successful. Next, we'll come around to the SU-27, which has no plus or negative on it. So we're going to need a five or higher, a 10, 
really good rolling here. And lastly, here on screen, we have our last aircraft that we fired at, the MiG-29. We need a five or higher. Can we go four for four? Yes, we can. That is an excellent start, taking out some of the most dangerous aircraft right away. The Phoenix missiles may cost you one point a piece. And I don't think I mentioned when you're using SO points for the special weapons, like we see here on the Syria card, those AIM-54 Phoenix missiles are a special weapon. You have to spend points equal to the weight of those special weapons. And because I only used four points, we can see that the first four points do not cost me. So I didn't spend any SO points for this mission yet, which is great. That'll save me more for the next missions, and I can use them more effectively and actually spend them in conjunction with that four free. Next, we place the turn counter, and that actually begins our turn, turn number one. We have five turns to complete our mission. If we do not take out the target in the middle, the central command or whatever target it would say on here, sometimes there's additional targets in the form of uh, sites. If we do not take that out by the end of the fifth turn, the mission is considered a failure. The first part of the over the target phase is the jettison decision, which means any pilot can drop some or all of their weapons. I don't mean drop them on a target, I mean just let them go and lose them. That usually only occurs if you are worried about bandits and you're actually dogfighting in the same zone because air to ground weapons give you a negative when you're trying to fight air to air with a bandit in the same zone because of the extra weight on your plane. Sometimes you might want to jettison the air to ground munitions to make you more maneuverable. No one is going to do that. And here's where it differs because we're in the night. Normally we would go fast pilots attack first, then sights and bandits attack, then the slow pilots would attack. But in this case, we have these four night counters. And we'll put these in a little bag or a bowl. And you draw them one at a time during each turn in the night phase or in the night attack. And this will determine what order attacks will take place. So whatever we draw, those are the sites, bandits, or friendlies that will attack. And we'll keep drawing until we get done with all four. And then we'll move on with the over target phase as normal. My hopes are that either slow or fast will be what I draw because, well, slow would be the greatest because all my pilots are slow pilots. So I would get to do all of my attacks before any sights or bandits. Fast would be okay because I could use my situational awareness to go in the fast phase. Let's see what we end up with. And we got the worst possible one, which is sights. So the sights will attack first. That means everything that has a range that can hit us will attack. We'll start here with the north and work our way around. First up, the first sight we have is this SA-2. It has a range of two and it can attack high targets or high altitude. Just about, well, not everybody. These are out of range down here, but this touches this area. So one, two, one, two, come over here, one, two. So all four of them are within range. So we'll randomly roll to see which pilot will be attacked. We'll assign the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I'll reroll any ones. I'm sorry, any nines or tens. The attack will be going at Lightning. Lightning has a couple of our anti-radar weapons, so we want to try and avoid this. This is where the ECM pod, the electronic countermeasures, come into play. You see that six, yellow six in the upper right corner? That means if I roll a six or higher when attacked, I could, it just negates the attack outright. I'm done with it. I got a six, so that attack is a failure. I don't have to go any further. The bandits don't attack yet. 
and come around here. These all have a range of one. This has a range of three, which can reach every pilot. So we'll assign numbers starting here again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'll reroll eights and higher. We have a one, so lightning is getting attacked again. Let's see if his electronic countermeasures will help. They will not. So now we want to go into suppression and evasion. In order to suppress, a pilot has to fire a successful attack at the site that is attacking the pilot. It doesn't have to be that pilot per se. It can be anybody, but only one suppression attempt can be made. We still have three bandits out there and we have a lot of sights. I don't want to lose this aircraft so early. So, oh, it's a tough decision. Do I want to expend a rocket, an air to ground rocket? I do not, not right now. Because what happens in the suppression is if you're successful, that site doesn't get destroyed. It just means the attack is negated, that's all. So what we will do is, since we're deciding not to suppress, we will evade. Lightning can evade by adding one stress. Normally you add two stress, but if a pilot is carrying an ECM pod, you only add one stress while evading. When you evade, you're going to roll the dice twice, and you can use the lower result. If we look at the SA-10 when we roll the die, if the number is a 1 or a 2, it's a complete miss. If it's a 3 through 5, we will add one stress to the pilot. If it's a 6 or a 7, we will damage the aircraft and the pilot will lose all weapons and the ECM pod and basically become useless for the rest of this mission. If it is an 8, 9, or 10, the aircraft is destroyed and we have to do a search and rescue mission on the way home. And that will cause us a lot of negative victory points, too, if we lose a plane completely. So we're going to roll twice and hope. I don't want to add stress, but that would be the next to best case scenario. Best case would be I roll a one or a two on one of these rolls and we're good. But if I can't get that, I want a five or lower. That is a two. I don't even have to roll the second one because I get to pick the lowest result and... Whether I roll lower or not, that is excellent. That pilot will take no stress and no damage. We keep going. None of these have a range great enough, but we will go to the center. And the only thing that has the range would be this SA-11, which is even more dangerous because only a one is a complete miss. So we hope whatever plane it attacks, the electronic countermeasures are successful. It has a range of three, which means it can reach anything because it's in the center and everything's within three of the center. So we'll go with the one through seven again to see who is attacked. A seven this time, which is our pilot eyes. This is a critical one because that is who is giving us our bonuses for air to air attacks. And I completely forgot about those bonuses when I was rolling against those bandits with those Phoenix missiles. But I was successful with all four, so no harm there. Maybe I will suppress. I don't want to lose that bonus. That thing will attack. Unless I roll a one, it's going to add another stress. All right, I'll take the chance. I don't want to expend any air-to-ground munitions because I'm not... Well, if I was in the same area as that weapon system, I would expend something, one of these lesser bombs, but I don't want to fire something that's long range right now. So I will take one more stress onto eyes to evade because, oh nope, I actually have to take two more because eyes does not have an ECM pod. It can't carry any of those items. So he's already on the borderline from going from okay to shaken. That doesn't detract from any of his skills though. So with the SA-11, we're looking for a one, and if we can't get that, we want a five or less. We get to take the lowest roll. That is a six, that is not good. Well, we're gonna take the six. The six means the aircraft is damaged. Normally we would remove all of the chits from the aircraft, but it doesn't carry any, but it will also take two additional stress. 
and that will take eyes all the way up to five, which is right on the border of being unfit for duty. One more stress and we're going to lose all those bonuses. So I'm hoping the bandits do not get to attack right now. But looking at the board, none of the bandits are within the range of eyes, so we're okay there. Now if eyes gets attacked again and takes one stress, he's unfit and out of this mission. If eyes gets attacked and is damaged a second time, the aircraft is destroyed and we'd have to do a search and rescue. So that is all of the sites. Now we'll move on to see what is going to attack next. And it's the bandits. We have no luck this round. Sights went first, bandits go second. This bandit has a range of one, the MiG-21. The MiG-23 has a range of two and it's in the center, so it cannot reach any of the pilots. The only one that can is this MiG-23, has a range of two which would put it in range of all four of these up here. And we'll go ahead and roll to see who it attacks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is a five, so Duke will get attacked. Duke does have an ECM pod. Let's roll. A 10, the ECM pod saves him from the attack. We don't need to go any further. And that's all the bandits can do. So are we going to get slow pilots or fast pilots? We're going to get slow, which is good. Because that means fast is last. And I can use situational awareness to let a slow pilot attack in the fast phase. So all of my pilots will get to attack if they're within range of enemies they want to attack. Plus that'll give me a chance to expend these two situational awareness from eyes in case this aircraft is lost. So we'll start, let's see what we have here. We have Farm Boy who has these air to air. He is one, two, one, two away from both of these. The more dangerous is the MiG-23 because it starts hitting on a three and it has a range of two. And you can see that we're adjacent because one, this area, and two is that area. We wanna be sure we hit this thing. So I will fire both of my air-to-air -air rockets at it, the AIM-7s, and they can hit it at a range of two. That particular target is a plus one to my roll, plus farm boys plus one. With these AIM-7s needing a six, we just need a four on one of these rolls or higher. We have the six, that MiG is destroyed. That's another piece of the more dangerous weapons out there taken out. Farm boy completed its attack in the slow phase. Now we have the rest of our pilots to go. Duke is, where are you at Duke? You're up here in the north. We wanna take care of these really dangerous weapon systems. So the most dangerous ones are the SA-15, the 11, and the 10, because of their low numbers. At least the 15 has a range of one. So let's go for the long range stuff first. The SA-11 and 10 have the longest range on them of the sites that are still here. So we'll fire both of our 88s, our AGM-88 missiles. They have the radar capability. And we will go after this 11 first since it can hit on a two. So that's a radar guided weapon. I only need a four to be successful. And you can see that that site has an R, which means it is susceptible to these types of weapons. Duke has an air to ground of one, or sorry, plus one, and will only need a three or higher to take that site out. But I wanna be sure I take it out, so I'm firing both at it. All right, can we do it? That is a one. So we have a chance of failure here if we roll another one or two. That's a nine, that site is taken out. That takes out the threat of the SA-11. Uh, these weapon systems, these enemy weapon systems actually have other names. These SA designators are from uh, NATO. I didn't look to see what the SA means, but I'm guessing it means surface to air. Maybe that's what it means. These are surface to air weapons. Uh, if anyone knows, please say so in the comments below. So Duke is 
done with his attack. He only has ground air to ground weapons left. Griffin has a couple of 88s. So does Lightning. The next most dangerous one is this SA-10 here because of its range of three. We're going to take a chance here. We'll have Griffin just fire one at it. If he misses, we have Lightning right here with a range of three. One, two, three. So we can attack it. And I'll attack with both then. But I want to try and save one for a, a next round. So Griffin will attack with one AGM-88. He has a plus one air to ground, so he will need a four. Or rather, a three at the lowest. And he got a two. The gamble did not pay off. That weapon missed its target. And to make sure we get it taken care of, we will fire lightnings, AGM-88s at it. Lightning's air to ground is a zero, so we are going to need a four or higher. Can lightning take this thing out? Nine. Yes. If you're successful with the first one, the second one is lost either way. That's the chance you take when you fire multiple weapons at a target. But if you really want to take something out for sure like that, I decided that it was worth taking the chance and wasting two of them. Well, wasting is not exactly the right word. The second one was wasted. That leaves us Blackhawk and Caveman still to go. Both of them have air-to-air -air weapons that are at a range of two they can attack from. Aim sevens, so we have Blackhawk here. One, two, he can fire at that bandit. And then Caveman is over here. That center bandit is out of range of everybody. So since we're getting low on bandits, We'll go ahead and have Blackhawk fire both AIM 7s at the MiG-21. It is a plus 2. Blackhawk's air-to-air -air is a 0, but that plus 2 goes to us. So the AIM 7s normally need a 6. With that plus 2, we need a 4 or higher on one of these two attacks. No problem. That leaves Caveman. All the weapons that Caveman has cannot hit anything at its current range, and Eyes does not attack. Which means we will now be into the fast attack portion. We have no fast pilots, but we can use situational awareness to give a pilot an attack during the fast phase. Give a slow pilot an attack during the fast, fast phase. I want Eyes to use these up in case he becomes unusable. Griffin has that one AGM-88 left. Griffin's down here. Let's see, these are all low. These can hit low and high, but that's a bandit. This is actually, that's dangerous because it only needs a one to hit it. And it's hard to hit. There's two of those out right now. So Eyes will give a situational awareness to Griffin. We'll expend it, allowing Griffin to attack in the slow phase. I'm sorry, in the fast phase. There's two of them out there. We'll just aim at this one, I think. Let's see. Lightning. Who has my big bombs? The 84s are Duke and Griffin. Where are they at? Duke, Griffin are down here. All right. So we'll go with it. We'll have Griffin fire. We have a air to ground plus one, so we need a three or higher with this radar guided weapon. Ten. Well, that'll definitely do it. That takes care of one of these dangerous weapon systems. I think I may have missed my plus one for my air to air attack on one of these bandits that would have taken it out, but I'm not going to go back and look at it since there's the only the one left. Also, that attack was at a negative one, actually, because of the SA-15's modifier, but a 10 was more than enough to take care of it. Is there anyone else I want to use? Oh, Caveman has an air-to-air -air weapon, oh, but it only has a range of two, and we can't reach that bandit. Nobody else has anything that's got a range on it to take care of any of these other sites right now, so that will be it. We will move on 
to the next part, which is aircraft move and adjust altitude. We're going to leave eyes here. You can stay in the same area you're in. You don't have to move out of it. Farm Boy has no weapon systems left. Farm Boy has used everything, but I will move forward in case we come down to using our uh, onboard 20 millimeter cannons. Farm Boy does have those available. Those are a very rare hit since you need a 10. Well, actually, I don't think I can hit anything because his air to ground is minus one. Well, I guess I could if I attack something that's a plus one or a plus two. So we will move him in. Lightning is carrying some air to ground bombs. We'll move in. We'll stay high up. Or should we? Let's see. These can all hit low, but they have no range on them. This has a range of one and can hit low. It can't hit lightning there. This can only hit a high target. So we will drop lightning down to a low altitude and we'll do the same for farm boy when we move him these have a range of two and one this one can hit me in low this one has numbers that are more beneficial to me so duke will move and stay at a high altitude caveman has two items that can attack high or low so we'll stay high that way, at least only two of them have an attack possible. So we have Griffin and Blackhawk. I don't see anything that has the range to hit them. So we will stay high altitude with both of them. So our pilots have moved. After we move and adjust altitude, the bandits move. If a bandit, for example, this... MiG-23, you can see it has a range of two. If a bandit is within range of a aircraft that it can fire at, it will not move. So that bandit will stay in the center area. After that, we advance the turn counter and we will begin turn two. And I'll go a little faster in the turns now that you've seen one and I've talked through it. I'll still talk about my uh, strategy and what I'm doing, but I won't explain the rules as much. And if it's something that has not come up, I will make sure I put it up on the screen so you can see it. 